This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome everyone to worship at Georgetown Presbyterian Church on this day. This morning is a very special time of worship for us as we celebrate the two Presbyterian sacraments that we have. So as we usually do on the first Sunday of each month, we're going to gather around the Lord's table in a little bit together and celebrate communion. But before that, we're going to celebrate with the Sawyer family as they present little Samuel Bolivar for baptism. Both communion and baptism are these beautiful moments where we see God's grace in action, God's amazing love reaching out to us first, and we all get to be a part of that here today. This is also Dedication Sunday when we return our stewardship pledge cards as well as our, those blue time and talents surveys later in worship. We'll be bringing those up during the last hymn and we'll have baskets on either side of the table up here for you to drop those off. And in bringing forth those pledges, we see that it's not just about the financial, it's all about who we are and who God is calling us all to be as the church. And for all of the things that are happening in the life of our church today and in the coming weeks, I invite you all to take a look at the back of your worship bulletins. Uh, Y'all can read the calendar. You can read the announcements that are there. You'll find so many different opportunities for fellowship, for study, and for service. And we just welcome you to prayerfully consider those and see where you might get connected to the life of this church and into our community. And now let us prepare our hearts to worship Almighty God. Our souls long for you, O God. When shall we behold your face? Our souls are uneasy. When shall hope lead us to praise you again? During the day, your steadfast love sustains us. During the night, your song washes over us. Our hope leads us to praise you. We praise you, our song of hope. Let us pray. Lord God, we come into your house as people seeking a heritage. We need your provision in our lives just as you provided for your daughter, Ruth, a foreigner without status. You gave her a home, a family, and a heritage. Your provision, Lord, is enough. It's all we need. Bring us now into your heritage and form us into your people, mighty God, restorer of all our lives. And now cover us in your love and grace as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
please remain standing with me as you're able for a time of confession. We are a people born of water and the Spirit. We have made promises to be Christ's faithful disciples and to show his love till our life's end. Although we fail to fulfill those baptismal vows, God's faithful love endures forever. Confident of God's grace, let us now confess our sin and the sin of the world. Holy and merciful God, in your presence, we confess our failure to be what you created us to be. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. By your loving mercy, help us to live in your light and abide in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Sisters and brothers in Christ, hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. And at this time, I'd like to invite the Sawyer family to come on up with little Samuel Bolivar. Philip and Emmy Sawyer are presenting their son, Samuel Bolivar, for baptism this morning. Sam is the little brother of Roddy and Mary Mack. He's the grandson of Lathan and Mary Garland Roddy and Paige and Susan Sawyer. He's the nephew of Robert and Martha Ann McCarley. And they're all here with us this morning. And Sam is surrounded by all sorts of family and friends on this very, very special day. As we are gathered, let us hear the words of our Lord Jesus who said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Obeying the words of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises to us, we baptize those whom God has called in baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are joined in Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament together. So, Philip and Emmy, do you desire that Sam be baptized? Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your son? And now I invite Lathan, granddaddy, who is a ruling elder from First Presbyterian Church Sumter and is now part of Maysville Presbyterian Church to ask a question of us, the congregation. Our Lord directed us to teach those who are baptized to you, the people of the church, on behalf of the whole church 
and Jesus Christ undertake as the parents Christian nurture of Samuel Oliver, promising to tell Sam the good news of the gospel, helping Sam know that all Christ commands are by our fellowship, strengthening Sam's family ties to the house of God, confirmed by standing. Let's affirm our faith. The word has not only been read and preached, but also seen, tasted, and touched. God has often made material things channeled through which his grace is understood and powerfully experienced. In baptism, the Holy Spirit has confirmed God's saving action with vividness and power. We believe, we believe that, that in baptism, baptism the, the Spirit, Spirit demonstrates, demonstrates and confirms God's, God's promise to include us and our children in his gracious covenant, cleansing us from sin and giving us newness of life as participants in Christ's death and resurrection. Baptism sets us in the visible community of Christ's people and for both children and adults as a reminder that God loves us long before we can love him. Let us all pray. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks. In countless ways, you've revealed yourself in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and gave us cleansing and rebirth. We praise you that in baptism, you give us your Holy Spirit, who teaches us and leads us into all truth filling us with a variety of gifts. Pour out your spirit upon us and upon this water. Bless your child, Sam, who comes to the waters of life, who lives in your grace. Send your spirit upon him through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Come on in. <laughs> oh. Samuel Bolivar. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now let us sing. Oh, this is the sweetest little baby. He's been looking at everybody and waving at them as we've been going by. You know what, Sambo? You are so loved. Your mom and daddy love you. Your big brother and your big sister love you. Everybody in this church loves you. And we just made lots of promises to raise you up so that you can know about Jesus and how much God loves us. And we're so happy that you're a part of this family now. You see your aunts and uncles in the faith, your brothers and sisters. Here we are. Yeah. Oh, he's so sweet. <laughs> we'll bring you back to mommy and daddy. Good job, Bubba. Good job, Bubba. Good job, Bubba. And we have this baptismal certificate for y'all to help you remember this day. Blessings on all of you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to ask all the children to come join me. I love it. Come on. 
Good morning. Sure. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Joseph. Hey, Mary. to hear your voices. Say it one more time. Just good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, um, we just saw something really special happen, didn't we? Did you see what happened? That's pretty special. And now Sam, Sam is part of God's family just like we are. And did you know that you made really special promises about Sam and when he grows up in this church? You didn't know that? Well, let me tell you something. You made really big promises when um, Pastor Jenny baptized Sam and, and um, Mr. Roddy asked you different questions. He, you all agreed that you were going to help him grow up in the church and that you were going to love him and that you were going to be his friend and help him learn about Jesus. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Did you know you could do such awesome things? Well, you can. You can indeed. Well, Pastor Corey is going to be talking about somebody in the Bible, in the Old Testament, actually. He's going to be talking about Naomi and Ruth and kind of what happened there. I'm not really sure where he's going with it, so hopefully we're on the same page. But um, Naomi had two sons, and therefore she had two daughter-in-laws. One of them was named Ruth, and the other one was Orpah. And so their husbands um, died. And so when they died, Naomi, their mother-in-law, said, you know what? You need to go back to where your home, where your home is so that you can start a new life and maybe get another husband or, you know, start all over again. Well, one daughter-in-law did that. But the one daughter-in-law that didn't do that was Ruth. And Ruth did something really special. Ruth was very, very loyal to Naomi. And Naomi tried really, really hard for Ruth. You don't have to stay here with me, Ruth. It's okay. I'll be fine. But Naomi was Ruth's family now. And do you know what the word loyal means? You do? What's it mean? What's it mean? God, well, God is part of being, well, yes, that's part of it. That's part of it. God's always part of everything, you know. Loyal. What about faithful? What does that mean? Are you going to be faithful to Sam as he grows up in the church? Oh, oh. So does that mean you're going to be loyal to Sam as he grows up in the... Okay. Well, I have something that I want to show you. Eliza was so nice and let me borrow Buddy. I'm going to bring Sadie Mae, and most of you know Sadie Mae, but I was advised that I probably shouldn't bring her this morning. So um, Buddy here is a very loyal companion to Eliza. And... Buddy loves Eliza. Buddy sleeps with Eliza. Buddy eats with Eliza, right? Buddy plays with Eliza. How many of you have a dog? Mm -hmm. Or you might have a cat, too. And if you don't, that's okay. But have you ever noticed that when you look at a dog, you have a dog? You have a duck. Well, that's okay. I cannot wait to hear all about your animals in just a few minutes. <laughs> Always happens. Um, but I want to tell you something about a dog in particular. And this is not to say that cats aren't wonderful and other things aren't wonderful. But a dog, out of most pets, really wants to be the most loyal because they want to make you happy. They want to, they, you know what, they want to eat all the time. 
So they kind of follow you everywhere. So they, they're kind of loyal that way because they stay by you. And they eat everything all the time. Treats and table food and all sorts of things. But like Buddy and how Buddy is so loyal to Eliza and Buddy goes everywhere, that is how Ruth was with Naomi in the Bible. And that they were very, very special to one another. And it was very, very special that they kept a loyalty and a faithfulness to one another. And sometimes when that doesn't happen, that can hurt our feelings. You know, if someone's not faithful to us or someone's not loyal or hurts our feelings in a friendship, sometimes that can hurt our hearts. But I think Buddy does a great job in being loyal. I think my little Sadie Mae at home does a great job in being loyal after she gets a treat. But um, I think it's really important to remember those things, those people that are close to your heart, how being faithful to them and being loyal to them is very important. And little Sam is the perfect example today. We can be loyal and faithful to Sam and his family as he grows up in this church. What do you think? Yeah? Thumbs up? Okay. Let us close with our Jesus Loves Me. You ready? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. God's children said, Amen. All right, friends, we're going to go out this door in the fellowship hall this morning. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from Ruth 1, verses 1 through 18. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab. He and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephraelites from Bethlehem of Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives, the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she sat, so she set out with the place where she had been living. She, he, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. 
But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to even have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people, to her gods. Return, your, return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. Our second reading from Scripture is also from the book of Ruth, selected verses from the third and fourth chapter. Here again, the Word of God. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. 
Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, All that you tell me, I will do. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. The road was dusty and the journey was long. The sun beat down upon their heads and their stomachs rumbled with the snarl of hunger pangs. They were running on empty. But still, they marched on, these three women, in their suddenly nomadic existence with what was left of their lives either in their hands or tied to their backs. The two younger women followed the older one closely out of respect and also because they really didn't know where it was that they were going. They traveled on until at last the older woman could not resist the urge to turn around and to tell the other two, look, you've done all that you can for me. Go back home and find peace with your families. I appreciate your efforts, but I can fend for myself from here. God bless you both. Now go home. A little bit stunned by her words, the two younger women began to protest, but the older one cut them short. Go back, I say. I know that you love my sons, and I know that you love me too. But I'm too old to have more sons that you might marry, and you two wouldn't want to wait around for them to grow up anyway. You're both young enough to find husbands. I love you like daughters, but it's time that we parted ways. You go back to your people and I'll go back to mine. Now, off you go. One of the younger women gave these words a moment's thought and figured that they made good enough sense and turned to go back home. Soon she was but a speck on the horizon, shrinking just a little bit with each step that she took along the road that led to Moab. But the other one would not let herself be moved. She kept walking down that road toward Bethlehem, a few steps behind her mother-in-law. In exasperation, the older woman turned back and said to her, Are you still here? I thought I told you to go back to Moab. With a look of devoted resolution, the young woman peered into the eyes of her mother-in-law and said, Please don't make me go back. I want to go with you. Your people will become my people. Your God will become my God. You are my family. Realizing that her daughter-in-law was bound and determined to follow, the older woman relented. And together they began to walk again slowly, but surely along that dusty road that led to Bethlehem. What are we to make of the circumstances that I have just described, the circumstances of Ruth and Naomi? What can we say about the portrait drawn in our minds of these two lone figures walking along a desert road? Two women 
One young, Gentile, the other middle-aged and Jewish. The scriptures tell us that Naomi first came to Moab with a husband and two sons. We might go so far as to say that she arrived with a full house. The sons were married, both married to Moabite women in the land of Moab, Gentiles who worshipped alien gods, didn't worship Yahweh, they worshipped other gods. In time, Naomi's husband as well as her two sons all died leaving her with two daughters-in-law. Suddenly, she no longer had a full house, but an empty one, given the sensibilities of those times. She had no prospects. And as a widow in the ancient world, she was made to be completely reliant upon the mercy of other people who might offer her some form of assistance. This rarely happened unless a widow was fortunate enough to have a male relative around who was willing and able to help them out. You see, in ancient Palestine, the identity of a woman was largely bound up in the identity of her husband. Sadly, having no husband often meant for unattached women having no real, meaningful identity. Finally, news came of the cessation of the famine back in the land of Judah, and so Naomi decided that it was time for her to return there. In her hometown of Bethlehem, she knew that someone might be willing to redeem her from the misfortune that she had suffered while she had been away in the land of Moab. The custom of leveret marriage existed in ancient Israel, whereby a man's brother could marry that man's wife, his own sister-in-law, if that man were to die. If his brother were to die, he could marry his sister-in-law and could even have children by her who would be considered the deceased man's children. It may seem a strange thing to us, but that was the custom. It was considered the proper thing to do in a situation of untimely death. In fact, the surviving brother was obligated to take his own brother's place so that the deceased man's family might not die out. The custom, though again seemingly strange and, and even unseemly to us, was quite prevalent in many Near Eastern, Middle Eastern cultures, including Israel. And specific mention of it is made in the 25th chapter of Deuteronomy, if you want to read more about it. But these women had no one left who could serve them even in that way. Their house was now empty, and the family of Elimelech was in danger of being extinct. Even more pressing than that, the women were in danger of falling victim to starvation. So in their emptiness, they set out on the road to Bethlehem, seeking to be filled. I think it is a most curious thing and not some accident that the word Bethlehem is translated from Hebrew, meaning house of bread. They went to the house of bread to be filled. The rest of the book of Ruth is about this quest. Naomi, once full but now empty, once pleasant but now bitter, seeks to be made full once again. The story of Ruth and Naomi works on at least a couple of different levels, I think. First is the level of practical concern. They are suffering from the most basic of human needs, hunger itself. The famine seems to be persisting in Moab, and the two women's family situation makes it nearly impossible that they would be able to get any, any food there. They were widows without kinfolk to help them out. We can say this probably with a little bit more assurance about Naomi, who was Jewish rather than about her two daughters-in-law. No mention is made of their families, but it does seem possible that underlying all of this is the assumption that during a famine, Naomi would, be allowed, uh, would not be allowed to eat in Moabite dwelling places, in Moabite homes. The Moabites weren't about to give away precious morsels of food to foreign people right in the middle of a famine. If this is in any way true, then it makes it all the more plain to see that Naomi would retreat back to her homeland of Judah. Even though her family might never be restored, at least she wouldn't starve to death. With the barley harvest coming, maybe some grain could be gleaned from what the harvesters spilled that would provide them with some bread on the table. And yet beyond the practical concern, this story also has a level of spiritual concern. 
Naomi's emptiness is about more than hunger pangs. It's also about loss. Loss of a husband and two sons whom she must have loved quite dearly. Of course she did. It's about anger, disillusionment of what has become of her life. It may also be about feelings of guilt that somehow their misfortune had been caused by the fact that she and her family had left the land of Judah to begin with when it was supposedly the land of God, the promised land of God. Had she in some way offended and angered Almighty God Himself? She may well have been thinking that she could set things right with God if she could just make her way back to Judah, back to her people, the Jewish people. So seeking to be filled spiritually as well as physically, she returns with a daughter-in-law, a Moabite woman named Ruth. Ruth has her own concerns. She is no stranger to the experience of loss. She, after all, has lost her husband at a young age. Yet in an amazing show of courage and devotion, Ruth turns away from all that is familiar to her, forsaking her homeland, forsaking the religion of the Moabite people, choosing instead to go somewhere she has never been, to live among a people she doesn't know. And most importantly, most significantly, to worship a God who has, by all accounts, chosen a nation that she's not a part of. So it is clear to see that both Naomi and Ruth come to Bethlehem to be filled with grain in a time of famine, and also hoping to be filled with the bounty of God's merciful care. I wonder today what it is that we seek to be filled with in the empty places of our lives. The very fact that we gather as a community of faith attests to many things, not the least of which is that we assemble together with a fervent hope that by our worship and by our study by our service, that we will somehow know God just a little bit better, that we will understand God with more clarity, understand what it means to live according to God's plan for our lives as disciples of Christ. In one way or another, I think that most all of us are searching to know more about what it means to be filled by the Holy Spirit, to be embraced by that tender care and empowered by the Spirit's guiding wisdom. Most of us would like to experience still further what it means to be touched by the providence of God. It might be said that our own spiritual quest, as varied and unique as they may be for each and every one of us, are all in some way journeys to Bethlehem. Longings to arrive at the house of bread and there to be fed with spiritual food. The underlying assumption that we bring to this quest, and indeed the great miracle that defines it, is the fact that God does care. God cares. The difficulty of, of preaching from the book of Ruth, one of the reasons that I had so many different verses from three different chapters read this morning is that it's one of those biblical stories in which the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's hard to understand any particular passage in Ruth if we don't have the whole picture before us. Let me try to give just a brief synopsis of what takes place once Ruth and Naomi finally get to Bethlehem. Given that the barley harvest is just getting underway, Ruth is allowed to glean the fields. That is, uh, to come along behind the pickers and to scoop up the good barley that has been spilled upon the ground and then to take the things, the, the grain, the good grain that she finds, to take that home to share with Naomi. She soon meets up with a compassionate man by the name of Boaz. You heard him made reference to Boaz, who owns the fields and, and also happens to be a kinsman of Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech, probably a distant cousin of some sort. Boaz takes Ruth under his wing and he looks after her in special kinds of ways. And eventually Boaz volunteers to be her redeemer 
and he takes her to be his wife. And they have a son together whose name was Obed, the great grandfather, the grandfather actually of King David. As the story ends, Naomi takes the baby into her arms. And in a, a poignant moment, the women of Bethlehem proclaim that a son has been born to Naomi. Of course, Ruth was the mother of the baby, biologically speaking, but he is Naomi's son, inasmuch as Naomi's fullness has been restored to her. Her family line is now intact again through the birth of this male child. One obvious point of the story is that God did care for Naomi after all. No matter the level of abandonment she may have felt at different points along the way, God did care. Having begun so full and rendered empty by the death of her, uh, the members of her family and by famine, in the end she is made full once again. Once bitter, she is now again pleasant and worthy of the name Naomi. The character of Ruth is herself proof of God's activity as she demonstrates by her living what it is that faith is really all about. Leaving Moab in the beginning with not a lot to gain and seemingly a fair amount to lose. She follows her heart to be a source of sustenance and comfort for her mother-in-law and in some way to be faithful to God, a God she doesn't yet know and only later comes to experience. She endures the hardships of the journey and the anxiety of being a stranger in a strange land in order to be filled the empty places of her stomach and to be fulfilled in the empty places of her heart. Face value, Ruth is an unlikely hero. She's a widow, a young widow with no prospects and no land. Worst of all, she's not even a child of Israel. But how plain it is to see that she was most assuredly a child of God. Ruth's story is about the way God raises up the meek and the humble to do great things sometimes. Her story gives testimony to the fact that time and time and time again, God plays tricks with our worldly assumptions and does extraordinary things through ordinary people in order that divine purposes might be accomplished. Through this faithful, lovable Moabite woman, God sustained the lineage to David and through David's descendants gave us our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Indeed, God does care. As God cared about Naomi and Ruth, so too does God care about you and me. The way in which God works extraordinary things through ordinary people makes me mindful of some other travelers who traveled down the road to Bethlehem hundreds of years after Naomi and Ruth. A decree by the Roman government that a census should be taken forced Judean heads of households to go back to their places of birth, to where their ancestors had come from. A young man named Joseph took with him his pregnant young wife, Mary, from the town of Nazareth, where they lived, to Bethlehem, where Joseph's ancestors were from. When they arrived, no accommodations could be found, and they were forced to sleep in the stable with livestock. Mary went into labor, and it was in that place of the most humble beginnings that Jesus Christ was born. The incarnation of God became a reality in a rustic barn without any real fanfare, and yet it remains the greatest gesture of God's care for humanity that the world has ever known. In the ordinary events of life with ordinary people, once again, God pulled off the extraordinary. To be on the road to Bethlehem is to be confident of God's care for us and hopeful that God's love expressed most supremely both in the person of Jesus Christ and through the movement of the Holy Spirit, that, that love will sustain us. Even when we think that the journey will be treacherous, and it often is, 
We are called by God to make that journey without turning back. The catch is that as we travel that road seeking to be filled, we must in turn fill up others, as Ruth did for Naomi. And that coming to be served, we must serve others, as Christ did for His disciples, and by His victory, as Christ did for all the world. From this house of worship today, let us, you and me, go and do likewise, serving God and serving others with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. For unto us a child is born. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord of the long and dusty road, your provision for us never ends. Your watchful care is intact even when we don't sense it. Your mercy fills us up even when we do not perceive it. Your grace and truth never end even when we do not believe it. Help us always to treasure the ways that great things are done through the ordinary events of human life. Empower us to live in faith and hope in all of life's circumstances, no matter if they bring us joy or sadness or doubt. Move us to follow you wherever life may lead, knowing that your grace is sufficient. This we pray in the holy name of Christ, our living Lord and Savior. Amen. It is now time that we share in that second, second sacrament of this morning's service as we celebrate communion together. I know that some of you came in the back door, and I will just say briefly that uh, the way we have been observing communion recently, rather than having the elders serve you in the pews, is to hand you the elements as you come through the door. And I am hopeful that if you came in this way, you might have received the elements, but I'm suspicious that some of you may not have received the elements. If you came through that door, you likely did. So I'm just going to ask at this time, if you did not receive the elements of communion, uh, to please raise your hand and an usher will make sure that you have those elements with you. Right over here. Does everybody else have the elements? I just want to make sure that everybody has, has bread in the cup. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from north and south and from east and west to sit at table in God's kingdom. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with His disciples, He took the bread and He blessed and broke it, and gave it to them, and then their eyes were opened and they recognized Him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust Him to share the feast that He has prepared. Now let us join together in singing hymn number 515, verses 1 through 4. I come with joy.
And now let us affirm our faith with words from the Heidelberg Catechism. I'm sorry, a brief statement of faith as found in our bulletins. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. The Lord be with you. Also, also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them to the, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right. Give our thanks and praise. praise to you, O God, for all your works. You created the world and called it good and made us in your image to live together in love. You made a covenant with us, and even when we turned from you, you remained ever faithful. Therefore, with all creation, we declare your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Thank you, O God, for sending us your Son. He lived among us and told your story. He healed the sick and welcomed sinners. He shared our pain and died our death, then rose to new life that we might live and all creation be restored. Remembering your boundless love revealed to us in Jesus Christ, we break bread and share the cup, giving ourselves to you to live for him in joy and praise. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we may be his body for the world. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and with one another until we feast with him and with all your saints in your eternal realm of justice and peace. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. When Jesus was at table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed and he broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat, whenever you do this, remember me. And in the same way, he took and poured the cup saying, take, drink. Whenever you do this, remember me. Now, whenever we eat and drink at this table, we celebrate Christ's death and resurrection until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The bread of heaven. Salvation. Let 
us pray. Loving God, you have given us a share in the one bread and the one cup and made us one with Christ. Help us to bring your salvation and joy to all the world. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. I would invite and remind all of you that as we sing our final hymn, that you are uh, invited to come and bring your pledge of support for the work of the church in the year ahead to place it in the basket or to place your regular offering in the basket if you are so inclined to do that. Let us now sing our final hymn, Take My Life, Let It Be. Lord God, we pray that the offerings we make, not only of our financial resources, but of, of our labors and our lives, that they would be fitting in your sight, that you might use us, ordinary people, to do extraordinary things in this world by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that the pledges that we have made on this day and those that will be made in the days that lie ahead would be of benefit for the building up of Christ's body here at Georgetown Presbyterian Church and in other places in the wider community. Again, help us to, uh, to share the treasures that we have been given, that they might in some way bring you glory, that they might do your work both near and far. For it is in Christ's holy name that we make this prayer. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of His countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.